Hey, welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888-699-9395 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. Welcome to Hell Has an Exit. This is a podcast that I'm starting. Um, this is based for people in recovery, people who have escaped uh, hell-ish conditions and have lived to tell about it. It's the first time we're doing this. I have uh, my childhood friend, Alejandro Bernal. What's going on, everyone? My name is Alex. I'm excited to be here, man. Excited for excited what you're doing here, you, brother. Bro. Yeah. It's Very been a cool. while. I know. It's been, it's funny because I've known you for what, like 18, 19 years? Yeah, it's crazy to even think about that, yeah. And then, yeah, life has its ways, man. Everybody like departs, but then... Comes back. Yeah, sometimes. You always have your childhood friends. There's nothing, the thing with us, and I think a lot of people we grew up with, is that I cannot see you for five years and then pick up right where we yeah. left off and then... For the whatever. most part, you're, yeah, you're easy to speak to. I feel like some of the guys that kept going on that... Mm -hmm. negative path and you talk to them it's you have that love for them still yeah but it's hard to connect with them it's hard to connect yeah because there's just nothing there anymore unfortunately yeah a lot of times when people change and get older if you guys aren't on the same page or whatever even spiritually mentally whatever it's hard to reconnect after years but i just feel like we've always been close and a lot of times i was thinking about this last night like growing up we were like brothers oh yeah we were together every day and i think talking about hell has an exit and you just brought up spirituality i think that's what snapped me out of a lot of stuff is just that wanting to understand yourself and like on a deep level because everything is so superficial especially down here in south florida everything's who's gonna party the hardest Mm -hmm. who's gonna outdo the other person doing something you're not really supposed to be doing i didn't realize until i got older but growing up in south florida we definitely had a different experience than other people it was just wild down here and it's just too drug oriented mm-hmm. a lot of the kids that we grew up with had their parents having all the money in the world and instead of actually taking advantage of that ourselves you steal money when, uh, when you're on a dark hole and then you go and you get whatever mm-hmm. you needed to get high and <laughs> yeah I, mean, I think that's like a common misconception is that i don't know but for me like growing up i know kids that grew up in in nice big houses that were way more fucked up oh and even more street eventually than some of the kids that grew up in some of the lower income the houses areas, or whatever. Yeah. Like we had kids that grew up in Weston and grew up to be gang members and drug mm-hmm. dealers. And I have a friend of mine that grew up in Weston and had an attempted murder charge for shooting up a car when he was like 16. And it's like, dog, you live in Weston. Yeah. <laughs> but Chunk bang in the suburbs, man. Let's get into it. I don't know much about your childhood. I think you have an interesting, amazing story. If you want to do 15, 20 minutes to just share like how you grew up when we started. Yeah, uh, like before we, we met. Yeah, before we met and then like how we met and then we'll take it from there. And then I'll ask you questions in the middle. Yeah, I actually didn't really start noticing that my life was that crazy until just about when I met you. Mm-hmm. Just because growing up in Colombia, having that money and growing up with private yachts, private airplanes, helicopters. At 14, I was 13, 14, my first car was a Grand Cherokee green bulletproofed with a chauffeur. I didn't have a license wow. and I, they were just getting driving around. Uh, yeah, I was like 13, 13, 14. And my mom would borrow the car, but she would have her car. And then we had a chauffeur, which was, it was a family friend, but he was still des- designated mm-hmm. to drive me around in the in a bulletproof car. And it was normal. But to me, mm-hmm. I didn't know any different. So I was just Did driving around. Did you just think that all cars were bulletproof? No, I knew mine was bulletproof and I felt like <laughs> a badass. But I never really asked what my father did or what mm-hmm. anything of that was. It was just normal. I think I was maybe five or six, and we had three, four farms, four apartments. My mom had three or four cars. My dad would have two or three cars in each property, Mm -hmm. and that's just the way it was. So I didn't know any different. I didn't really ask what he did. Now, growing up, I always wonder, did you guys have dinner every night together? Was your dad around all the time? Was he disappearing? No, he was never around. He would have shown up maybe every three or four months for a week, maybe two. He would come by with a couple luggage bags full of toys, one for me, one for my brothers, Mm -hmm. and then one for my mom. And he'd just stay. He would visit for a week and a half and then just bounce again. We wouldn't see him for two, three months. 
and maybe during holidays. So like for Christmas, he would come mm -hmm. down for the month and then that would be the family time. And during those times, yeah, we would sit down, have dinner and be more like sociable. But during the regular school year, mm -hmm. it would just be my mom wasted. <laughs> like I would get home from wow. school and then I, I would get home. Like, I don't think I've ever seen your mom drunk. My mom got soberish because she still mm -hmm. drinks once in a while, but she stopped once we moved over here because she was forced to be a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, down there, we had two maids that lived in the apartment with us, and then wow, so a I never thought about maid. that. So, like, when you guys were living in Colombia, your mom was still like the party wife, uh, yeah, doing whatever she wanted to do. She probably was shopping. a badass in her own right, man. Yeah, she mm -hmm. would. Uh, so I would get home from school on a uh, Tuesday, and she'd be wasted on the couch, just mm -hmm. passed out, wasted with two or three of her friends that were there. And then, if it was just my mom and the neighbor, I would wake up my neighbor. Her name was Dolly. Mm -hmm. I love her to death still to this day, man. Uh, I would wake her up and tell her, hey, Dolly, it's 3 in the afternoon, man. <laughs> you got to yeah. go home. And she would just walk home. And then I would wake up my mom and I would take her home because my brothers would get home at 4. And I just didn't like my brothers seeing my mom like that. They did a couple of times, but it was just not a deep process of a thought. It was more, hey, mom, come on, let's get up and get you to the bed. And it still wasn't a big deal because you're a kid and you just see your mom. Oh, crap, mm -hmm. she's drunk. Let me help her. And I just took her to the bed and then she was fine. But she didn't really have to essentially take care of us because the maids would wake us up, make us breakfast, make the beds, do the laundry, cook, mm -hmm. clean the house. She would be a mother in the sense that during the weekends, she would gather up all the cousins, take us in the car. We'll go to one of the properties, one of the farms, spend the weekend, come back home. Mm -hmm. And she would party all through the week, all through the weekend. She was just constantly shit-faced. <laughs> That's interesting. And then, so I guess for people that are listening, they could probably try to figure it out. But your dad was probably how high would you say up there in like the Medellin cartel when he got charged of the operation was called operation millennium it was mm -hmm. in 1999 if i'm not mistaken it was like 30 simultaneous arrests mm -hmm. throughout the country they put fabio choa and my dad as the head mm -hmm. because my dad was the connect here in florida and fabio was the connect down in colombia but they were both owners of their land and they were growing it together it was mm -hmm. really what it was yeah because i think i was reading your, they were saying your father was responsible for 30 tons a month the funny thing is that when i while he was in jail i asked him if that was true and he chuckled and he said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking i was like dude i'm pretty sure it was way more than he that. never really told me what the answer was because mm -hmm. and you of met course. my dad eventually yeah. but he chuckled and he's like oh that's what they know if that's what we're gonna leave mm -hmm. it at yeah, and exactly. i just i was like this fucker yeah. <laughs> he was funny man but it was all business for him you know what i mean like he even growing up and then later they call on him like the bill gates of coke or something he was very intellectual right? he was the numbers guy he was mm -hmm. the one that decided what the cost should be of the kilo mm -hmm. and how much they should ship in one shipment how much they should pay the guy that's landing he was, so the he was numbers like logistics guy. And numbers. yeah he was a logistics guy what was he like as a kid he was like himself as a kid or when, when I was really kid, young? Yeah, I mean. He was actually very involved in my early childhood up to when I was like four or five years old. Because before then, even though he was already making moves here and there with Fabio, mm -hmm. Pablo Escobar was still alive. So he wasn't really in the game fully. That mm -hmm. was more his friend, his childhood friend, which was Fabio Choa and his family, which were the ones that were really intertwined with Pablo Escobar. My dad was just a connect mm -hmm. and he had his i think he sold like italian or french kitchens down mm -hmm. in fort lauderdale and that's just what he did he sold kitchens and he was doing fine mm -hmm. it was him my mom myself in an apartment and i want to say when i was three almost four that's when he started blowing up that's when he decided just out of the blue okay we, we have to move to colombia mm -hmm. and there was just no questions asked my mom had no say in it i think my mom was trying to like start up a company down here he didn't really let her. He's just wow. Gone. So your parents met before he started yes. everything. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, they met before he started anything, and I've actually had the conversation with my mom because once my father's mm -hmm. gone, you have questions that you never ask, and you're like, "Hey, yeah. mom, how did you guys start? Like, was yeah. he normal? Was he always like this with you? You know what I mean? Because oh, wow. he was at the end, he was a he thought way too high of himself, mm -hmm. and it made sense. But my mom's, oh no, he was a completely different human being. He was sweet. He was gentle. He was like super in love with her for the first two years. They traveled the world. They went to Monaco. They would go to Dubai. Mm -hmm. They would go in Dubai. Back then was nothing. It was just to explore Europe, Canada, Alaska. They, you know, they went everywhere. And So let's go back to the childhood. So you're 13. You have a 
bulletproof green Grand Jeep <laughs> Grand Cherokee. Cherokee with a chauffeur. Mm-hmm. We would drive around because the windows were too thick to actually roll down. So whenever you wow. ordered like food or anything, you have to open up the door. Oh, you couldn't roll down the windows because they just... would go like halfway, if that. They wouldn't go all the way down. So it's not like you could just stick your hand out and, and grab like. And could you fast drive food. in Colombia at thirteen? Like you're driving? I drove it several times. I didn't have a license. But yeah, because I remember they let as kids, it. you would tell me like, "Oh yeah. yeah, bro, I used to have a car," and I'm like, "Never yeah. had no car, bro." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was cool in the sense that as a kid, you I felt that sense of freedom. And you had bodyguards and stuff like that? Or just not really? My chauffeur, my chauffeur, was he had a mm-hmm. carry-on. But it was weird, man, because I would drive around and just look at everybody else. And I knew my life was different. Like, you, mm-hmm. you can't help but to know your life is very different, but not really knowing why. Because essentially, your dad was probably a billionaire, Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. When, so at some point, maybe when I was like seven or eight years old, I asked my dad that once, actually. Like um, how much money you well, make? Yeah, because I, I would see everything we have and we would go to his friend's house and his friend's house is no house. It's a private island mm-hmm. with a landing dock with a helicopter. And the only way to get to his island on is helicopter. on boat or a helicopter. Yeah. And we would go on a helicopter. I'm like, oh, dad, whose helicopter is this? And he's like, yours, baby. I'm like, mm-hmm. this isn't mine. He's like, no, anything that's mine is yours. So I was like, so this is yours? And he's like, yeah, it's yours. And I was like, oh shit, I have a helicopter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And we would go to his buddy's house and it was a mansion on an island in the mm-hmm. middle of i don't even know where and when you asked him so what when i say? asked at seven i was like seven or eight years old i'm like dad are you a millionaire and again with that same sarcastic chuckle he's like billionaire baby with a capital b wow and that just always stuck, stuck in my in head and i was like yeah we are different and then yeah. that started getting to my head just because i didn't really know what he did still but you started to feel egotistical as a young kid oh and, dude and entitled huge. Oh, yeah, because he would tell me everything's mine. We would go to a property. He bought a property, and it was 425 acres, just one property. Mm -hmm. He built, I think it was like a 5,000 square foot at the top with two horse stables, a party house on Mm -hmm. the side. And it was literally like a full mountain. The property was a full mountain. And you look down at the property from any direction. It's nothing but mountain all around you. And you ask my dad, what is all this? Like, how big is this? Mm -hmm. And his only answer would always be, don't worry about it. This is all yours. This Mm -hmm. is yours. You grow up, this is going to be yours. So you felt very entitled, like you said. And Mm -hmm. eventually I figured, man, I'm set. Like, I'm going to be a god when I grow up. Mm -hmm. But nope. Nope. (laughs) Which eventually ended up being the biggest blessing just because it's like it does connect you to a a much more humble human side. Mm -hmm. But before he got arrested, before any of that, and we would go out all the time, the parties were absurd. For their birthdays, it was just bonkers. They would have the mariachi bands that they would go and take over there with private adult performers. Mm-hmm. And then they would have all the kids distracted with bound houses. Prostitutes? And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably like tons of girls. Oh, dude, tons of girls. And the wives were okay with it because the husbands are making so much bread that it is just, they don't have an option. But they enjoyed it. They had fun. The girls would go there. They would... Have <laughs> and as a kid, did you know that it was cocaine that there was? Like, I have no idea it was even know. illegal. Oh, you didn't even know it was illegal? No, <laughs> not even because oh he had God. side hustles. So he had you didn't know that cocaine was illegal? You didn't no, know, I didn't know that what he did was oh, illegal. Okay. I knew coke was illegal <laughs> okay. and I knew what it was. And I had buddies at 12 or 13 years old that would smoke weed and we would mm-hmm. front upon it. I'm like, oh, dude, like you guys do like illegal shit. That's so stupid. Mm-hmm. Let alone my dad was the one freaking supplying the whole thing. Mm-hmm. He had uh, several buildings with warehouses, and he mm-hmm. would rent them out, and that was under my mother's name. So that was her quote-unquote income. He also had a recycled plastic bottling company that would bottle wow. soaps and sprays and household goods, and that was one of his legit businesses. And my mom would tell me, I'm not kidding you, like once every six months, if anybody ever asks, your dad does. He sells soap. He has his own soaping company. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why do you tell me this shit all the time? No one's ever asked me what my father does. No one goes around your school saying, hey, what does your dad do? That doesn't happen. But she just always made it a point to tell me, hey, so it just engraved in my head. You know, why would my dad do something illegal if he has that business? Mm-hmm. Then once he got arrested, when, you know, Operation Millennium happened, I was. You didn't know until then? Yeah. Wow. I found out when he got arrested. But what hit me wasn't so much the fact that he was going to be missing because he was already never really present. It was more the fact of... but So was your relationship with him like you didn't like him or... Oh, I loved him, bro, to the end. Oh, wow. He was hilarious. 
gotcha. he was super fun to be around. So whenever he did when he come was around, around, you just figured he, he around, worked a lot. Yeah, and okay. that's what he that's what he, he said. said. Yeah, yeah. So he would take me to the properties. He would pick me up and then take me to a property, mm-hmm. and then we would go visit the horses. And when your dad's not around that much, if when he is around, it's so great that you know it kind of compensates it, yeah, yeah it compensates time you're missing. because you're missing him the whole time and yeah. they're like perfect in your eyes exactly yeah. and then not only that but then he's telling me do you like all this stuff do you like your farms do you mm-hmm. like the horses because i had me myself i had four or five horses and he's do you like all this stuff he's like yeah and yeah, i, would I tell him, yeah. tell me he used to ride horses right? oh all the time and then he would tell me he's that's why i'm gone so much because mm-hmm. if you like all this stuff i have to work for it so that wow. you guys can have all this stuff yeah when did he get arrested how so old was, were you i was about 13 in mm-hmm. 1999 when he got arrested and like i was saying what hit me wasn't so much the fact that he was going to be gone because he was a physically he wasn't present it was more the fact that i was like oh shit i had a deep feeling that it almost felt like a pull inside my chest i was like oh shit my dad's a bad guy that's when it hit you how oh, did you find out that he got arrested did your mom uh, tell you was my on dad the news? i got home from school one day it was probably like a wednesday or thursday I usually wake up seven in the morning to go to school, mm-hmm. but this day we woke up at four in the morning to banging at the door. There was someone trying to break through the door, but we lived in a penthouse. Mm-hmm. Our penthouse door was bulletproof, bazooka proof, actually. Wow. It had a metal plate in the center, and there was four huge metal bolts that were closed. The, the size of the house key, my house key, mm-hmm. was, I'm not kidding you, probably the size of my palm. Wow, that's a big so key of the door a, was. It's a big old key, bro. Yeah. They couldn't break down the door, which is mm-hmm. hilarious because there was military personnel outside and they couldn't <laughs> break in. So they ended up having to ring the doorbell and allow ac- <laughs> and, and ask, ask for access. Yeah, yeah, and ask to open. So the maid goes out, looks for the peak hole, and they're military men with guns and machine guns, and everybody's trying to break the door in, but they can't. Mm-hmm. So then they ring in the doorbell asking for permission to come in. And my maid, hold on. So she comes <laughs> and she give me a second. <laughs> She goes, she gets my mom, she wakes everybody up. It's loud as shit. They're screaming. So then I wake up. We all, mm-hmm. they take all the kids out to the living room. I don't think my brothers were there. I think my brothers were actually at my grandma. So it was me yeah, and my mom. Yeah, because you actually have two brothers that are. My twin brothers. Twin brothers yeah. that are my age. Or they're a year older than me. They're almost a year older than you. Yeah. Because gotcha. okay. they ju- they're turning, today's their birthday, actually. Yeah, 31. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, I'm so stupid. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's Simon's birthday? Yeah. Bro, they're twins. They're it's twins. They're yeah, birth- two. Mo- yeah. Most years. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, oh, cool. It's one of their birthdays. Yeah. But- they're, uh, it's their birthday today, so whenever they hear this, happy, happy birthday, birthday, bro. Yeah. So, yeah, so my brothers were actually, I think, with my grandma that day, and we got woken up by, by the military personnel. So they were looking for your dad, or they were trying to arrest yeah, they you were, guys well, too. Well, it was a simultaneous arrest, and they were trying to get thirty-two drug dealers. They, they were one trying day, to arrest like the just entire doing, cartel yeah. and the one the same operation the same morning. And two of them. I got read away. online that your dad was the number one person. It was really Fabio, because Fabio is the one that got my dad in, into it. But it's not like he held back. He ran mm-hmm. in guns blazing. He dove in head first, and yeah, he was the head in his own just because. Mm-hmm. He wanted it just as much as Fabio. Fabio was They called just, him the juvenile because he was like... Juvenile. He was the young kid in the block and he made it quick. He made it really fast. Yeah. But for all purposes, Fabio mm-hmm. was a much smarter, yeah. low-key... Even though he had a lot more properties and a lot more money, he was low-key as far as his presence. He mm-hmm. wasn't out at public, going to restaurants and stuff like that. My dad was. He wasn't flashy, but he was all over the place. Now with us, at least with the family members, I never saw him in a public place. It was always like someone's property, house someone's house. Yeah. Or yeah, it was never a restaurant or anything like that. But Fabio was even more low key. Did um, you meet him? Fabio? Oh, yeah. Wow. Fabio was like an uncle to me, man. I've known him my entire childhood. Me I had and, no idea. That's yeah. Crazy. So me and his, I'm not going to say their names, but mm-hmm. me, both their sons and their daughter, we all grew up together to the daughter. She's the younger one here wow. and there. And my mom and his wife are still friends, actually. Wow. And there's actually a fallout because, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but when my dad died, a lot of people thought that Fabio had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. And after speaking to his wife, she was like, no way, he's devastated. But the media has their ways of Mm -hmm. twisting everything up, saying, oh, he's got like enemies or whatever. Of course. Let's uh, get back to, so they're breaking down the house. They have to ring the doorbell. Yeah, yeah. So they ring the doorbell. I wake up. We're all at four in the morning and we're in the living room. They're not saying a word. They're not letting anybody move. There is 
three or four people aiming their guns at us. I'm probably like 13, mm -hmm. 12, 13 years old. My mom's there sitting with me. And the two people that were aiming their guns at us, their fingers weren't on the trigger, but they were ready for anything. My mother asked, do you really have to point that at me and my kids? And the two that were aiming didn't answer. The one, the commander that was standing there, she, you just don't ask questions. You sit right there, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And then the other guys were searching the entire house for the safe, which they never found. Mm -hmm. There was nothing really in there. Either. It was just some cash and like private, you know, papers and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not like they have a stash of cash. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. because At a house. Yeah. yeah. So then they found my dad in his house in Bogota. Mm -hmm. And same thing. They broke down his house and they were looking for cash over there. So I still didn't know what that was about. Mm -hmm. Seven in the morning came. I took a shower, went to school. There was military personnel all through the building when I left. All I was in the penthouse. I went to so, school and, that day? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my mom probably wanted me out of the house, yeah. man. She was like, go to school, bro. Wow. So then my neighbor, Juanca, which his birthday also just passed. He's, dude, there's like military personnel everywhere. And he's my childhood friend, too. And I was embarrassed. I didn't even tell him they're in my house. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, man, weird. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, so, yeah, we just we went to school, and it was normal, just a normal day. But that scene, it was still in my head. And then when I got back from school, on the way back, I told Juan I'm like, yeah, you remember those people in the morning? He's like, oh, yeah, I wonder if they're still there. I was like, I hope not, man. They were in my house. And he's shut up. And I was like, bro, like, inside my house since 4 in the morning. Oh, snap, dude. And he immediately, he was a little bit older. He's like, what's your dad do, bro? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I have no fucking clue, man. And wow. I got home. And when I got home, he walks into my house with me. And my mom's just bawling, crying in the bedroom. And she asks Swanka, can you please go home? And then, so he goes home. And then my mom sits me down and tells me, they arrested your father. He's going to be in jail for a long time. But give me the rundown. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, man, really? Why? And I was so young, I was 13 years old, that I literally asked, did he get like a really bad ticket? Wow. Like, <laughs> my dad can't be a bad guy, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, did he get a bad ticket? Yeah, bro. He must have left his car in the wrong so parking <laughs> spot overnight. <laughs> yeah, something. And she still didn't really tell me. So then I think it was about a month later, he had a court hearing. Mm -hmm. And we all went. And it was just obvious at that point once you hear the judge reiterating everything there was so like then that's seven when charges. it really hit you that it was hard like, or something huge seven that charges level, like it's not really selling drugs it's like a corporation you know what i mean yeah when you have that many people under you he's probably got i don't know thousands of employees yeah at that point. i remember too when i asked him and this is like later on in the years once he was in jail here in the u.s i asked him how much money were you actually generating a month and he's for myself or for my team? I was like, no, for your team, for everybody. He's mm -hmm. like, I don't know, 30, 40 million. I was like, Colombian pesos? He's like, no, dollars. Yeah. Damn. Like, yeah, it's how a big company. It, and what's crazy is that the government makes sure they take everything. Yeah, I was wondering, how does that work? It took years. It took it, years for them to take everything. Because I always wondered, bro, your dad had all this money stashed and paintings and all mm, sorts of nothing. stuff. So like, that's actually... The, how did this... So the tangible stuff was actually what my mom survived on once we moved here. Because mm -hmm. she didn't have a job. Yeah, um, I she never went it was to school. so crazy because I'm just like, bro, there's no way they can find everything. There's got to mm -hmm. be millions of dollars buried somewhere or something. I wish. So when that whole thing happened... We did, he did three years in Colombia, a little over three years. Mm -hmm. And then he got extradited here. And my mom's, we don't have a choice that we're going. And we actually came up about a year before he did, just so that we can get used to the area and all that stuff. So I came in here like my late 14 and I met you like two months after I, I moved yeah. here. So I was still, it was still sort of fresh. Wow. That's because, yeah, because at the time, I don't know what really happened at all. I know. So we're just like, I become just, friends. And you just then, like, you moved into a neighborhood. Yeah. And I knew that you had two brothers. And you went to school with my brothers. Yeah, I went to school with your brothers, but your brothers were, I don't know how to Childish. Like, <laughs> they were just like good, dorky kids, yeah. bro. They like dressed the same. They brought a lunchbox to school. <laughs> like, bro, growing up, you didn't pack your lunch, bro. That was no, no. like dorky. And, and my were, brothers would actually tell me, he's like, oh, you hang out with Brian? He's the bad kid in my class. I'm like, what? He's awesome. He's like, no, nobody messes with Brian. No one talks to Brian. He's Is he older? Did he fail a couple classes? I'm like, dude, he's younger than you. Yeah. 
yeah, I remember I was younger than your brothers. And that's how my life was that like I would have friends and I'd be I'd go to school with their little brothers, but I'd hang out with, with the older, older brothers. Kids, yeah. Your mentality was completely different though. I remember even meeting you and I remember seeing you with the go pitch with mm -hmm. Brian, forget his Jamaican. last name. Yeah, Jamaican Brian. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, yeah, I need to write one of those. And I remember that's how we met. I just started writing your GoPit and we became friends. And then I started going over your crib. And yeah, man, we've mm -hmm. been boys since. So when you moved here, because I just remember your mom just being like the nicest, coolest, and like your whole family, your uncle and your aunt. I just always have really good memories of that. So like when your mom came here, how hard was it for her? It was tough. She cried every day for <laughs> two years. Yeah. Because I imagine she had... But she had already done that in Colombia, too, so that... Because that it was already was three years. Yeah, it had already been So when years. did they start taking the stuff? Before we came here. So before we moved up here, out of eight properties, we had two left. Mm -hmm. And it was because the lawyer's argument was, it's not just about letting them keep somewhere to live. It's about depleting the lifestyle. You can strip away the entire lifestyle because you're now affecting, you're rippling and affecting the child's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So they let us keep one farm or one, we call it a farm. It wasn't really a farm. It was like a vacation home. Mm -hmm. And then the penthouse, which is where we lived. But slowly the apartments in Bogota, the house in Bogota, the farms in Caldas, like San Jeronimo, like all those properties slowly just started getting taken away by the government. And even the ones that weren't taken away, we were not allowed to actually step foot into. He was trying to sell some before the government got a hold of them. Mm -hmm. But the actual documents of the properties were just so tangled up that he just couldn't get rid of them. He couldn't free up the money. So at that point, the only thing that he could survive on was the tangible stuff, you know, the cars, the jewelry, the horses. We had well over 50 horses, and I think the cheapest one was like 150K. He had another horse that was like 500 that he would not get rid of because that wow. was his baby. He's yeah, like, I'm not selling that horse. I'm not selling that horse. And he didn't. He That was the last horse he sold, wow. and it killed him because the horse was like the champion in South America for Paso Fino for six years in a row. Mm -hmm. And it was still making him money, which mm -hmm. was helping cover the lawyers. Wow. I remember hearing the conversations of my mom. Oh, I owe this lawyer 250 grand. Let's just sell this horse. Mm -hmm. I'm like, shit, one horse is going to cover that? And, uh, that's just for, and that's just for one year of one charge out of seven charges. Wow. <laughs> so, and I remember all those conversations, and it was just normal. It was still normal. Mm -hmm. like, I understood that something bad was happening, but I didn't actually realize I'm not going to have anything at one point. My dad's going to figure this out. My dad's going to figure this out. And even while he was in jail. Wow. So you still thought for those three years in well, Colombia. He's, and he was still convinced when we would go visit off. him. I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. like, don't you worry. I'm going to get out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. And he would say that. And you grow up and you still, you want to do your own thing anyway. But that's still engraved in your head of, damn, my pop's going to get out at some point And he's going to kill it again. Mm -hmm. Eventually, regardless of what he does. So before we moved here. We would go and visit him in the prison over there, and he didn't get sent out to a specific jail. They had to pay for the jail that they were in. Mm -hmm. His jail wasn't really a jail. <laughs> like there what was, happened with Pablo? He like built his own jail. He, well, Pablo was different because he built his own jail, and that was completely crazy because my aunt actually lived across the street from that, mm -hmm. from Pablo's prison. You know what's funny is that, I don't know if you feel the same way, but when people ask me like, oh, do you watch Narcos or whatever? I hate that stuff. Me too. I'm like. It's so fake. I'm like, mm, nah, bro. Nah. <laughs> and even Scarface. I like. I saw Scarface, the movie, mm -hmm. and it's really As entertaining. A As a kid. And it's really entertaining. It's fun to watch. And you thought it was stupid, right? It, it's so stupid. It's Because people really glorify this. Oh, man. Hello to my little friend. Like, bro, it's not like that. Maybe in the U.S. when the, when the cocaine cowboys era happened, mm -hmm. it was wild. You, yeah. But in Colombia, it's all business. Nobody's carrying out guns. Nobody's sending out to kill anybody unless you're Pablo because Pablo was nuts. Mm -hmm. But my dad and his friends, it was all business. You rarely heard of anybody saying, go kill this person. Not once. And I was around it all. And I would listen to the business conversations, not knowing it was illegal mm -hmm. business, but listening to business conversations constantly and telling me, you got to talk to this guy because he's making the wrong moves or blah, blah. But never anything oh but one thing i wanted to say so when we're down there and i would go and visit him mm -hmm. and the jail was no jail there was a tennis court there was a soccer court there was a gym there wow. was a in foosball the jail? in the jail a pool table a foosball table each was there other inmates yes there was about i think there was like 10 or 12 out of the 30 that got arrested were in there so they could still 
conspire and do business from but, in there, uh, including Fabio and like all the other guys. Wow. And they were still handling business from mm -hmm. in there. And the cops knew it and they didn't care. They would say good morning to them. Right? And mm -hmm. ironically, the, the security would address my dad and the guys as Don Fabio, buenos dias. Yeah. Don Alejandro, como esta? Like, very respectful of their status uh, because they knew of who course, they were. Of course, bro. If you fucked with them while they were Oh, in man. There, yeah. And they were all getting paid to be of allowed course. to have cell phones, to be allowed to have direct TV. They all had king size beds. They mm -hmm. all have their own showers. It was a yeah. hotel. It was weird. And next yeah, door. Yeah, I remember hearing that you have these hardcore drug dealers go to prison. Yeah. And they're freaking out because they have to have their right soap. Mm -hmm. They're like, bro, if I don't have my right soap. That was my dad. <laughs> that was my dad because his soap came from Mexico. Wow. <laughs> so, so he's yeah. like, if he don't have the right soap, he yeah. flip out. <laughs> yeah, because they're so like they're not like these tough hardcore guys no. toting guns. They're like no. billionaires that like wash their hands a thousand times yeah. and like wear like my the dad nicest. would lose a direct TV for two days and he would freak Go nuts. out. He's like, You need to call the cable guy. Like yeah. You need to call He's the like, cable bro, guy. This like, Dude, is you're in prison, bro. <laughs> uncalled for. I had the worst day yesterday yeah. in prison. The cable went out. <laughs> Couldn't watch the, yeah, no, the like, fucking Mayweather no, fight. No. Uh, All right. And uh, back then it was Tyson. I remember them Tyson, talking about Tyson yeah. fights. Yeah, that was hilarious, man. So after all that happened and then the ex extra day, I, I felt like I didn't really have friends. Like it felt like everything got stripped mm -hmm. really fucking fast. I knew everyone and that made it worse. Because then everyone's, oh, shit, you're that kid. Mm -hmm. You're that kid. And then maybe out of everybody I had, maybe I kept one or two real friends. Mm -hmm. That's it. They never asked me about my dad. They never asked me anything. They yeah, just don't want to hang out. Yeah, scares people. Yeah. They're probably like, oh, oh yeah. Shit. A lot of, well, a lot of people fuck? were not allowed to hang out with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Hey, guys, um, you still playing soccer after school? No, some kids actually in school, they, my mom told me that I wasn't allowed to talk mm -hmm. to you. And not even in school. And they would just, I was like, well, that's stupid. Yeah. Like, it's me, bro. It's not my dad. I'm not the one selling drugs, you <laughs> moron. <laughs> yeah. They're just concerned for their safety and yeah. stuff like that. And, yeah, and it was that. And then once I moved over here, it made it 10 times worse because mm -hmm. I didn't really know the language. I barely spoke the language. My accent's heavy now. Back then, it was yeah. way worse. And then lucky for me, I met you, our buddy John, mm -hmm. Christian, Sean, the group in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And you guys made me feel at home. So I had some sense of home. Yeah, because even though we were like, Everybody was Spanish, yeah. right? Everyone was Cuban or Hispanic, something yeah. Hispanic. So everyone spoke Spanish except for me. Except for you. <laughs> Even though your dad always speaks to you in Spanish, yeah. you understand everything. You just never, never answered. <laughs> I could buy drugs in Spanish. That's about it. That's about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Drugs and food. But so you move in. And how does it feel knowing that? Did you care about this stuff? Because as a kid, you never cared about this stuff. I never heard you be like, not oh, a, I used to. Not about the uh, material the, no things. not the never, material bro. things it was more like the friendships and ironically i never really seeked out drugs until i got here mm -hmm. and it was because one the language the schools here felt like a prison really dude what's the difference the doors the smell the what's it like in colombia the lighting it's literally the same as the prison in colombia where my father was and when my dad got out they gave him the option you either have I think it was like a 10-year probation, mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to open up your own company. You have to be an employee for those 10 wow. years. For 10 years, you're not allowed to open up a company. Holy cow. You open up an LLC for one, 125 bucks. He mm -hmm. wasn't allowed to. <laughs> you That's can't. Crazy. Yeah. You can't own any. No LLC, no nothing. Wow. So he felt insulted. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know who the hell I am? And then. Yeah, I remember him feeling like. I'm going to do whatever yeah. the fuck I want to do. I don't give a fuck. And that's fuck. why he left. And your dad tried to talk him out of it. I, I tried remember, talking him out of it. I remember him being at my house and my dad telling him, like, dude, don't you go need, to Columbia. Do my dad was like, Brian, come talk to this guy. Tell him not to go not to Columbia. I was like, bro, are you crazy? And Alejo, he, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, and he, I remember he was like, what am I supposed to do here? Work here at McDonald's for the rest of my mm -hmm. life? He just had yeah. nothing. He's like, what am I going to do here? Yeah. Yeah, nothing. No. And he didn't really want to get into the business again. He just didn't comprehend the employee mentality. He didn't. And I respect him for it because you want to be able to pursue your own destiny in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he didn't want to. He left. But back to when I came back the first time around and I met your dad and then me mm -hmm. and you started getting close. At that point, I was already full blown. I want to try everything. I've mm -hmm. been drinking. I, I had already tried weed somewhere. How old are you at this point? 16? I had just turned 16. So you had just turned like 12. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm four years older. Yeah. So you had just turned 12. I had just turned 16. Mm -hmm. And you already had a pack of Newports in your pocket. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember the first and like, time I tell people my story, they're like, what do you mean? And I, it's crazy because when I meet my friends, 12 year old kids, mm -hmm. bro, they're so innocent. They're children. And when I was 12, bro, bro I had, had Newports, a Newports, lighter. A eight ball in your pocket yeah. and a double tape. Mm -hmm. A the, double tape. The Brian's Coke. double tape, bro. Yeah. You a were blowout. okay. So, yeah, for people that don't believe that story, bro, Brian at 12 years old was my cocaine plug. Yeah. <laughs> I was 16. You were my plug for coke. You would walk around with bars. I remember at 13, mm -hmm. you would have bars and coke. So you would tell me, hey, do you want a bar? I'm like, what the fuck's a bar? And whenever I would get drugs at that time, I wouldn't make a big deal out about it. Oh, I just, have just bars. happened to have a, yeah, two bro. Zans on me. And that's why I tried all that shit because Brian's... A lot of people think that, oh, your older friends might have got, got no, you into it. No, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I still don't know where you got that shit from. You were the plug, bro. I remember you would come up and like, yo, you want a bar? I'm like, yeah, I'll try one. Mm -hmm. And then 30 minutes later, you're feeling woozy as shit, oh but God. you're feeling like, oh my God, bro. And then you, on top of that, I'm already fucked up. Mm -hmm. And then somehow this 13 year old buddy of mine pulls out a pack of noopers. Hey, you want to smoke square? Yeah, I want a square. That's what we called mm -hmm. it. A square? Yeah, I'll smoke a square. And then you would pull out and just break. He's like, oh no, you, before you even showed me the Coke, I remember you would ask me like, yo, do you have a debit card or like a some sort of a card. No, bro, I don't even have a wallet. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would run to your house, which was next to the park, mm -hmm. grab some random like hotel card or mm -hmm. whatever you can find, like a business card, Something. come back out to the park, pull out the Coke, start breaking up like four lines and just do two lines right there. And hey, do you want one? I'll try it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. I mean, oh, I just remember crazy, doing drugs at a, at a super young age. And sometimes I forget like dude, you're how like, young that yeah, was. Yeah, bro, because... I remember the last time we spoke, you're like, oh, yeah, I did. I was doing coke at 13. I'm like, no, dude, you're like 12. 12. Cause, yeah, because yeah. I was sick. I had just turned 16 and you already mm -hmm. had it. You had to have been 12. You're four years younger than me. Yeah, yeah you were 12 and just starting 12. That's crazy. That's My crazy. stepson's I've, 11. Bro. I've been telling. Wow. Because I've been telling people 13 for a long time. No, but it probably it was 12. Because yeah. when I got here, I was sick. I had just turned 16. Because I think this is like summer going into seventh grade that I first started to do coke. Which is crazy because I was already wild. smoking weed. I remember weed was like... We would smoke all the I time. I was doing yeah, was coke normal. because I had already been arrested with weed. So I had to do a drug that comes out of your system. So yeah. I transitioned yeah, to I coke. Yeah, I remember you would tell me that too. He's like, oh yeah, you, you detox this shit out in 48 hours. Yeah. I'm like, how do you know all this yeah, shit? Yeah, bro, at the time I was in 12, I knew how long every drug stayed in your system. I remember. Whatever. But <laughs> yeah, bro, I remember just us being kids and smoking weed at the park and doing coke and girls uh, oh, i forget who that girl God. we had like a couple of cute several. girls there and, yeah, you dated yeah. that girl a couple ones but yeah you got all the girls yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah i didn't was, do too bad man that was fun back then but yeah but i remember i remember <laughs> this is what i remember i remember when we got everyone got barred out i don't know what happened but we all went to a party you me albert velez and all these people mm -hmm. I must have been in seventh Yo, grade or Rob something. Velez, man. He's doing good now. I I'm saw, I saw he was you. That's what's boy. up, bro. Tell him I say what's I up, will. man. I haven't seen him in years. Yeah. But I remember, whatever, I got super barred out again and did it like we were drinking malt liquor. And I remember I punched the Burger King drive through and broke my knuckles. I remember that. And blood everywhere. And then we all woke up on our parents' lawns. Like I was on my lawn, Albert was on his lawn. Sean was on the lawn. I think I woke up at a park. Yeah, you woke up at the park We're down the street. All spread out Bro. the neighborhood. And we had this whole talk. <laughs> and I remember I was the youngest one. I was literally like 12, 13, and maybe the plug. 13. And, the and plug. everybody else was 16, 17, yeah. juniors in college. And we had like this big thing. And That's everybody crazy, was thinking, bro. like, oh, poor Brian. These kids are manipulating him. And no, everybody was like, Brian gave Brian. us the Xanax, bro. <laughs> Brian's the one who had the Xanax, bro. None of us even wanted to do it. He convinced us. I didn't to even do know it. what it was, bro. Yeah, it was crazy. And then I was hooked after that because I was like, damn, that shit was good. And yeah. then we would get shit faced all the time. Yeah, we get of that. fucked up for a while. Sean ran naked a couple times because mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, dude. Sean was wild. And then you remember Chris Cabrera, you and mm -hmm. Chris or whoever it was, they Sean was like stripping and running down the street and someone took yeah, his we clothes. We would have wild nights streaking in our neighborhood. Yeah. And the thing is, like, our neighborhood's nice. You know what yeah, I mean? Dude, yeah. It wasn't I think the like cheapest a, house is like $400,000. Yeah, it wasn't it was... like a shithole neighborhood. It was no, like a bro. nice neighborhood. And then Pretty Rick and the Mavericks lived across yeah. the street. We had, like, a crazy childhood. Yeah. Spec, man. Yeah, Spec. I'm still Spec. friends with him. I still yeah. talk to Spec. I talk to Special. Um, man, those are my boys, man. Yeah. And Slick. I love Slick. He was mm -hmm. hilarious. 
yeah. all those boys were cool as hell, man. Yeah, we have an interesting but Yeah, remember like the park would just be popping at uh, Wednesday night. Oh, it's probably, like yeah. six cars. I know. Six cars deep, whatever. And remember we would be like when they were just first starting to build the Mavericks, they would mm-hmm. throw the videos in their house. Yeah, we'd have all we'd these do crazy... like music videos at their house. And Trick whatever. Daddy would come Trick through. Daddy, Trina. Yeah. Trina, bro. Mm-hmm. And you were the youngest and yeah. still supplying. Literally, yeah. you were giving them shit too, yeah, bro. Yeah, I remember that. Like, oh, nuts, I could get bro. Bud. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, I can get butt like it's all good. Yeah. That's, but, yeah, that's crazy, bro. To put into perspective, like the age wise, because Slick's even older than I am. Till today, I don't know how old he is because when we were kids, he would tell us he was like 18. Different ages. And then we're yeah. like, bro, it's been three years. Yeah, you've been three There's years. No way you're 18. 18. I had no idea how old he was. Oh, and man. he never went to school. Yeah, he never went to school, bro. <laughs> Spec, I remember Spec. Yeah, Spec that went low. to Western. Yeah. It's funny how, because me and him, he would drive me to school on that mm-hmm. beat up old Honda Civic. Yeah. And then he ended up hitting it, man. Yeah. He did good. That's He's awesome. Good. Yeah, I was just talking to him the other day. He's uh, trying to buy a jet. Is he? Yeah. If he travels a lot, and he, if yeah. marketing wise, it's feasible for him. Yeah, there's a lot of benefits to owning a jet. You yeah. can write it all off. I yeah. Mean, a lot of people, it's not that much of an expense when you could write it off. Yeah. But you could write off the whole price of the jet. So once I got here, yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, we always get sidetracked mm-hmm. with stories. But when I moved over here, it's just bitterness, bro, because you're just angry at everything. And mm-hmm. then the drugs was fun. It was a distraction. And it was, I don't know if it was the friendships or the actual drugs doing them so much, mm-hmm. but it just, I felt home. I felt okay. And I would be sober in school and I'd be pissed at the fucking world. Mm-hmm. Anybody would look at me wrong in the school and it was fight after fight. And then my boys were, it was the same thing. Everybody in school was just, anybody I associated with, it was, we were all the bad kids. And we Mm -hmm. were cool with it because those were the realest ones. I knew that those were the ones that were going to have my back. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we all got kicked out. We all got, yeah, we all got, they were going to arrest us all, but I think they all put us under contract and, oh, okay, we need to split every single kid and you all got to go to different schools. Some Mm -hmm. kids got kicked out of the state. Some kids got sent out to Georgia, another one to New York, another one to Washington. They sent me to Cyprus. Thank God it was down the street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that other kid, Jovan, he's not here anymore either. He went to Cyprus. Mm-hmm. Jamaica, Matthew, he stayed in Western. I went to Cyprus, still angry, you know, that. but the connects started changing. And I remember by that point, you had already OD'd like twice. Mm-hmm. And even though I still did stuff... What's funny is that in my mind, I didn't. Because in my mind, I'm like, an overdose oh, is when you're up. like on heroin and someone yeah, like Narcan's you. But for me, it was like, oh, yeah, like that time I woke up with like my lips blue. I remember but you telling me the stories and then yeah. your dad was devastated because me and your dad got really close. Because mm-hmm. him and my dad being friends, he would tell me, ay, mi hijo habla con Brian. Mm-hmm. Brian es un loco. Like, he's crazy. Like, <laughs> yeah, and, now, and in my, the back so of my head. So when did you like, start realizing that I was, because I know like we drifted apart because honestly there was just a point in my life where if you weren't doing hardcore drugs, like you, I just yeah. didn't associate know, with anybody. I and I was like embarrassed about it because people were just like. And I remember that. Because I remember you, when I, even when I started to do coke, because there was a time where people would do coke, but they would do it on special occasions. Mm-hmm. And then I'd come around and people were like, dog, it's no. 9 a.m. Bro, we're and playing you would... basketball. You're doing coke on the side. Like... Dude, you don't remember my ex girlfriend, Danielle, Sweet 16? Oh my God. Yeah. Bro, I have you a had like two separate bags with eight balls. Mm-hmm. And we're on a Sweet 16. There's no alcohol because parents everywhere. And I'm just skeeted out and of my mind. And me and you were going to the bathroom like every yeah. 10 minutes. Not even. I was going with you maybe every hour. You were going <laughs> every, every 10, 10 minutes, minutes bro. Yeah. And coming out with shit in your nose. And I'm like, dude, you got to at least clean your nose, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember I was like really into the girl that they like connected me with. I yeah. forget who she was. And I was like, man, this girl's gorgeous. And I remember. Was uh, it Courtney at the time? No, it was this other girl. I forget her name. Because Courtney had it for you for a while. Yeah. It was her sister. And Everybody. Things. Yeah, she had it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Sorry, Courtney. Yeah. But I remember she, it was this girl and she's like, yeah, I really like him. But what is going on with his nose? <laughs> and they were like, I remember Courtney covered for me. She's, oh, he has allergies. He has allergies. She's like this guy. And like, because remember we used to practice to do the dance for the Sweet 16. Yeah. And I would be all geeked out. But yeah, so I, I think there was a time where people, even with Coke, were like, dude, you're doing Coke too much. Like, I'm not going to hang out with mm-hmm. you if you keep doing this. I don't think I ever told you that I wouldn't hang out with you. I don't think it you was did, just other natural. I think it was just natural to drift because I just wasn't into it that hard. Yeah. Which is funny because people don't know that it's, dude, a lot of my older friends are my good friends and were trying to help me. A lot of people were like, bro, you have these fucked up older friends. I don't think I was smart enough to help you because I didn't think you were going to go down 
that deep as mm-hmm. fast as you did. I just remember one, I moved out of the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I went to a different school. Yeah, I forgot about and that. And then my substance changed. I started getting into rolls, acid, mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, Molly. Mm-hmm. And it was more like party drugs. Yeah, party drugs. And I was a little bit older and I was going to Miami and doing when all that stuff. When did you but... know that? Like, I, cause I always wonder how other people's perception was. Like, did you hear stories of me? Like, when I was getting worse and worse from my dad? From your dad, yeah. Cause he yeah. would tell me, he would tell me, he's, can you talk to him? He listens to you. You're mm-hmm. like his brother. Can you tell him? In the back of my mind, I'm like, what do I tell this kid that's four years younger? That was my plug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, like, I can't tell his dad, yo, he got me into shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bro. I'm feeling some type of way, bro. He kind of fucked my life up. Well, and I was there enough to not really get like too deep into it and not really get addicted to any substance, mm-hmm. which was a knock on wood. I've always been able to just, you know, yeah. I don't feel like any, I don't feel like doing this anymore and just cut it off. Mm hmm. Summer going into eighth grade was my wildest summer of my life. That's like, nuts. Bro. Partying, going out, whatever. And then right in eighth grade is when like it all stopped and then I just became a straight What's coke crazy head. is that it felt like you were my age that entire time yeah. because of the shit that we were doing. And it's like looking back. Yeah, damn, I, I bro, remember having 13. friends my whole life and we'd be driving and then they would look at me and be like, fuck, I forgot how old you were. <laughs> you know, like, like, I can't believe you're fucking... Yeah. 13 13 bro i was like bro i gotta go to school tomorrow yeah bro it's crazy They're like oh wait you go to fucking indian ridge yeah you go to indian ridge yeah. We're on- which was hard for me so like when i went to high school when i finally graduated i felt yeah. like i was in middle school for 10 years <laughs> but like when i finally went to yeah. high school bro i didn't fuck with anybody bro it's because all my friends had already graduated and yeah. were in college yeah. or whatever so i felt like i had nobody and like growing up Four years is a big difference, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, when you're 14 and your friends are 18, I couldn't connect with people 15, 14, 13. Like, I just was, like, on a whole nother. They were talking about going to the bowling alley. I was like, bro, the bowling Bowling alley. alley. People were talking about going to the movies on the weekend. I was like, what, What bro? I sell Coke. Uh You know, I thought I was, like, your dad. Yeah, (laughs) I remember. I I thought I was, like, some big shop. We have something that we say in recovery that, like, if you're not humble, you'll be humiliated. Oh, yeah. And uh, I feel my ego got so big and I thought I was invincible and I just totally crashed and burned Mm. and wanted to die and totally regretted everything I've ever done. I remember not necessarily following you from afar because I didn't really have social media, Mm -hmm. but paying attention, knowing what your dad would say because our parents still spoke and Mm -hmm. then your dad and my mom are still good friends. And my mom would tell me, Brian's getting better. He's going to to rehab and this and Mm -hmm. that. And then I started, I think it was MySpace back then. Yeah. And you started posting pictures of working out and shit. I'm like, I don't think I reached out, but I was like, oh, hell yeah. Like You could see it. Yeah, I could see the difference because mm-hmm. I was like, bro, this dude just got jacked. In eight months, I was like, yeah. he's healthy. Like, that's what's up. Like, that's what's <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, when he's I first got, a got new focus. clean, I was like obsessed with working out. Yeah. And I was like, hell yeah. He's mm-hmm. got a new addiction. Yeah. Health. It was awesome. And even my brothers at that point started talking. No, oh, have you seen oh, Brian? Yeah, he's I remember I would huge. see your brother when I had 18 months clean. Yeah. Yeah. At 18 months clean, bro, I drank water and ate boiled chicken and yeah. lifted weights and went to meetings. And yeah. that's all I did, bro. I just lifted and went to NA meetings. And my brother started seeing that. And then yeah, that I remember actually Simon's. what caused my brothers to work out. Because yeah, they're like, damn, he's younger and out. huge. Yeah. And then they started working out. Yeah, because I got clean at 17. Yeah. So I was 18, probably benching 315. Yeah. That's nuts, yeah. bro. I'd be yeah, surprised I if I, I don't think I can get even close to 200. <laughs> I probably I can't out. right now, bro. <laughs> like, I peaked out at 18, 19. I'm just like, whatever. I can't lift that heavy anymore. That's crazy, bro. And So then, let's talk about, like, your journey and, like, spirituality. Because I've just, you saw me mm-hmm. change. I've seen you change. Where, like, one day, dude, you're just posting crazy spiritual stuff. and uh, I love that stuff, man. Yeah. So, so how did your transition go from, like, the material life that you had as a kid to your dad going to prison, to dealing with his death, you really taking your different journey to like spirituality. I've liked the, like the spirituality aspect of life always, but as a kid, it's not something you necessarily pursue all the time. You don't really need it as a kid because you are spiritual. You you're are, so spiritual you like you're, already. You're, yeah. You don't really need to learn about it because you're just so new and. It's when you notice the disconnection between your child self and mm-hmm. who you became that you're like, okay, this is not who I am there's something really off and it's the wind doesn't feel the same I don't get joy out of mm-hmm. just looking at trees like I did as a kid like you you lose that wonder you know what I mean yeah. there's something different and it didn't happen for a while but ironically is when I started experimenting heavily with the hallucinogens because mm-hmm. I was yeah I remember you started doing a lot of acid and shrooms and I loved it and acid actually helped me cut off 
coke, other molly, drugs. and other drugs, which was great for its purpose, but it was also not, it's still not healthy. It's still a man-created substance, you know what I mean? So it's like something, it was one trip, one crazy trip, and I remember feeling, and you think that you're feeling because it's still an enhanced substance. It's not a real feeling. It was mm -hmm. a temporary feeling, but the thought process still was everything's alive. Even the wall That's next to me. Yeah, because when you're on acid, everything is alive. Everything is moving. But the thought process to it me. It is. And it, it is. is. Particles are so close yeah. together that it looks solid, but there is no such thing there is no as such solid. Thing. Nah, everything's they're moving and vibrating. Space. Everything is vibrating. I yeah. never realized that. But yeah, when you're tripping, mm -hmm. you see the vibration. You see the vibration. Mm -hmm. And then I was looking at the wall and thinking, this wall is alive. There's, it might not be organic life. But the energy is in there and everything in its energy. If there's frequency everywhere, there's sound everywhere. Or at least frequency. Because sound is just frequency that's audible to our mm -hmm. ears. But everything's frequency. So then after the tripping and getting into that, I was like, if it's real, that the substance is just bringing it to my attention. Because it's still there, regardless the of drug. the substance or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. And then my questioning at that point i didn't get too deep into that because i was bouncing in and out of jobs i was still doing a lot of drugs and it was mm -hmm. still my main focus i was losing jobs left and right just because i would get up and i would pay all my bills and the second i would be like three or four months ahead i would spend half that money in drugs and lose my job and then be wow. and be jobless again for a month or two and i'm like fuck i need another job because i just spent all my money mm -hmm. and what's crazy is that i was with my girl through that entire time mm -hmm. i've been with my girl now 10 years wow which holy cow dude she is amazing to see someone we'll get into that later but so i was losing jobs left and right using all that money for drugs and just doing stupid shit and i started asking myself again from the beginning does your spirituality have anything to do with your income because you seem to be more at peace when you don't make money or when you make a, a steady and i was like no that can't be right it just can't be right and I had some money saved up when we moved up. I still enough to, to carry me along for six months. So I was like, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to be with my son for three months. I'm going to take a break. And in my break, I was like, okay, what the heck do I do? <laughs> I'm home alone with my son all the time. I started smoking weed every single day. And it started as, damn, I got to trim the bushes. I need to do laundry. I got to clean. I got to cook. I got to do this. I got to do that. I'll just get high and do it because I don't mm -hmm. even feel like doing it. You've been in that house for so long. And I was like, I just got to do it. I have no friends. I have no family up there started smoking weed every single day for a year and a half. And then once it got to the point where I was probably smoking about an ounce every single week, I was like, shit, I can trade in my Range Rover and get a brand new one for that cost. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's an extra 400 bucks a month. I wasn't even working because I was spending it from my savings. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, this is silly. I went dry and I was like, I'm not going to buy. And the first 24 hours I slept, the next day, I started getting in the rhythm again of meditating. Like, I need to meditate. I need to find myself. I meditated every single day. I still meditate to this day, but I was very meticulous. I need an hour, at least an hour every single day in the morning or at night or whenever I can. Like, I need an hour every single day mm -hmm. and ask myself big questions. What do you want? Who are you? Like, at the core, what do you really believe? Because I've... You can convince yourself in your brain that what you're doing is right. But just because you want to justify what you're doing, it doesn't necessarily mean that the feeling below that is the actual feeling of what it is that you want to do. And then I started getting into my feelings and my emotions and changing my self-perception because mm -hmm. the idea I had of myself wasn't really who I was. And it made me cry a couple of times because I was like, I am a liar. I'm a fake. I'm a fraud. Like to myself, whoever sees me doesn't know who I am. That's not who I am. Like that party dude, that guy that wants to make the money, that guy that wants to be the center of attention. That's not who I am, bro. This guy that wants to pick up all the chicks and make my girl feel like, oh, you, like, I can't believe I've done this stuff I've done mm -hmm. to that woman, bro. And that she's still with me. <laughs> but I had to ask myself all those questions. And it comes from like really deep. Like I would sweat. Just sitting there. I was sitting there in the AC and I would sweat and I would cry. And I was mm -hmm. like, just breaking through barriers. Funny enough, I saw you posting something about a, a writer, Don Miguel Ruiz. Mm -hmm. And my mom was heavy into Don Miguel Ruiz. Oh, wow. And I was like... Dude, that book changed my life. 
Uh, which one? For agreements? The four or agreements. I've read the knowledge. fifth agreements. I've read, I've read almost all of his books. I've met him. I flew out to California yeah? and meet him. Yeah, oh, he's super that's cool. Awesome. You know how like, you think, oh, I wonder what he's going to be like in person? He's so chill. He was I follow like, him on Instagram. He's yeah, awesome. Yeah, he was like a grandpa. He was just I like him on YouTube too. He's super awesome. sweet at the treatment center that I run. That's one of the books we hand out to everybody. So that is... It's fun. It changed my life. It's the simplest it's book the to easiest read. read, man. You can reread it a hundred times and still see stuff that's yeah. out of there. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's crazy because I cannot imagine someone read that book and not get, get it. it. Yeah, dude. It's so fucking it's, ABC. It is. And it gets so deep so quickly. And Simply, it's, it's fucking fire. And then as I was going through those questions in my head about myself, I see him writing about it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this is exactly... What I'm going through, and this guy gets it. Like mm -hmm. this guy really gets it. And once I read that book, I was like, I need to realize that this isn't me. I'm not Alex. Mm -hmm. That's my name. And then it's look at my body. I was like, this isn't identity. me. This yeah. is yeah. This isn't me. My body belongs to me, but it's not me. But wait, if I'm not Alex and this body isn't me, then who am I? Am I in my brain? No, that's just an organ. Where do my thoughts come from? Do they come from, or are they just collective memories? So if they're just collective memories, if it's my head, and you start that deep process mm -hmm. of, okay, I'm getting too deep and I'm getting confused. Stop the mind. Just meditate. Relax. Let the answers come to you. And there was a couple of times where I got really solid. It was almost like a voice, but it was more like a, just a smack of truth inside of you just this. Mm -hmm. You are everything. You are everywhere. You are always and you ever will be. The past does not exist. The future does not exist. Things have happened, but when they happen in the present. The future will happen, but when it happens in the present. All you have is the present. You are here now. You are now. You are everywhere. And it was like a millisecond of a feeling that explained all that. And honestly, that's how it feels when you're on acid. But you have this interconnected, all at once -ness yeah. where it's time doesn't exist. The future, the present, it's all the same. I think in I Heart Huckabees where they have this blanket and he's, he puts his hand under it and he's like, this is a cheeseburger, this is an orgasm, this is you going down the street, but it's still yeah. under the blanket. Yeah. So he's just, dude, this yeah. is everything, yeah. you know? Same. And I think that psychedelics can help you get that clarity. Mm -hmm. But when the drug's gone, it's, it's gone. When the drug's gone, that whole clarity, and, and you're at traffic and you're pissed off again. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so if you so can't silly. take it into your daily life, it's mm -hmm. a fucking drug, bro. Yeah. I appreciate you. Thank you yeah, for having me, man. I love you, bro. Man. It's I always good you, to see you. I'll be coming yeah. by more often, Come man. visit, bro. Heck yeah. Love you, man. Love everybody, bro. All right, peace. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888-699-9395 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com.